My name is Mike McCormick and I'm going to read a story called From the City of Dolls from my collection Forensic Songs. From the City of Dolls. If you ever go looking for this pub, here's where to find it. Come off the Charles Bridge into Karlova, past the Torture Museum and turn right into Lilova. It's the first of three pubs on the short street and you'll find it behind heavy wooden shutters under a yellow gamber in the sun. During my stint as a regular, I played home to a crowd of hard work and expats, mainly British IT workers and American real estate sharks who'd been lured to the city on foot of a property boom that was just going into decline when I got there. One afternoon I gathered up my paper to make space at the table for a, a young woman in her early twenties who had materialised above me. Her height and her bone structure was an immediate giveaway. Cheekbones, a former girlfriend had assured me. Slavic women have these great cheekbones. Whatever about cheekbones, six weeks casual observation in pubs and on the street had convinced me that, should the need ever arise, the world could draw on this city's standing armory of lingerie models and off-duty action movie heroines. Pulling off her coat, this particular one motioned to my copy of The Guardian. You're English? No, Irish. Sorry. It's okay, we can start again. Beneath her coat, she wore a scoop neck t-shirt over a grey skirt and black tights. My gaze snagged at the top of her left breast where she appeared the scaly sheen of what I took to be scar tissue. And during the next few minutes I tried not to stare at it. She stirred her coffee, turned towards me and we fell to an easy, relaxed conversation. I told her my reasons for being in the city and she told me about a waitressing job and English lessons across the river in the Berlitz school. Then without warning she paused in mid-sentence, dipped her head into both hands and yawned hugely. I'm so tired, she said. I slept badly. Phone ringing all night, my flatmate is having trouble with her boyfriend. She yawned again and then added dozily. But at least I didn't faint, like I used to. I was flummoxed, phone calls and faint, and I couldn't see the connection. Before I could say anything, she went on, speaking now in the distant tones of one who was recalling some absent version of herself, with more than a trace of the amusement. When I was a child, I used to fall down in a faint whenever I got a fright doorbells or sudden crashes or even someone coming up behind me and tickling me. Down I go. But I wasn't the only one. My, old, my mother and my other sister did the same thing. She tapped her chest with a narrow index finger. It's a heart condition. A weakness that causes it to shut down whenever it rate rises suddenly. It closes down, shuts off the blood supply to the brain and I would fall to the ground in a faint. She shrugged. It was just a part of my childhood. Something I did. Something we all did, as a matter of fact. One day the phone rang in our flat and myself and my sister stood there and saw each other's eyes roll up into our heads before we passed out. My mother in the next room came in and pulled the fruit bowl off the kitchen table on her way to the floor. That evening my father came home and found the three women in his life lying in a heap on the floor. And two months later he took off to a clerical job in a lignite mine in Slovakia. She screwed her face up in a querulous frown. High maintenance, you use that phrase. Yes, we use that phrase. Well, then that's who we were. Three high-maintenance girls. Three women, I blurted. Three women fallen down in a faint. Yes, three women. You can read all about us in the medical journals. We're well known in the cardiac community. And my mother is the one with the looks, by the way. My sister and I are only so-so. I didn't remember arguing the point. Now she'd emptied her cup of coffee, I called for another and a second beer. Is it allowed, I stumbled. All that caffeine, I motioned vaguely with my hand. Oh yeah, it's okay. She touched the scar tissue above her breast. In the early 90s this new technology was developed and my mother and sister were among the first to be fitted with it. It's an electrical device that kicks in with 250 volts whenever your heart rate falls below a certain threshold. Like a jump start, I said. Yeah, like a jump start. I was only 16 at the time and they didn't know whether it would be safe to fit one for me. No one so young had had it done before. When my fainting fits were becoming more frequent and periods of unconsciousness were getting longer and longer, they were afraid I might fall down one day and not wake up. So shortly after my 17th birthday I had this thing fitted in my chest. She reached over and took my hand. Hers was cool and dry as if it had been dipped in talc. You can feel it here. Now she pressed my hand to the top of her left breast, making it yield under the firm pressure. Pressing hard on my index finger she ran it up and down beneath the seam of her t-shirt. Something wouldn't yield a narrow rib, thicker than an artery with a, with a synthetic hardness, 
ran vertically from beneath her collarbone and then seemed to sink behind the mass of her breast. Feeling that synthetic hardness beneath her warm flesh, my mind was crossed with a crazy, complete thought. This is how you turn into David Cronenberg, I said to myself. My head is going to explode any moment. Well, I'm proud of my scar, she said, releasing my hand. Four or five teenagers have gone on to have this implant, but I was the first. The warmth of her heart breast now hummed in my fingertips, and it took me a moment to gather my thoughts. It must affect your life. There must be so many things you can't do. She was now openly enjoying my astonishment. Her smile broadened. I have this little manual, she said. All the things I cannot do. Cycling up hills, sprinting, swimming. It's a long list, but as yet I've never tripped it. My mother has, though. One day we were hurrying to catch the metro in Malastrana, walking quickly, not running. And I was two paces ahead of her at the top of the stair when she called out to me. And when I turned around, she was sinking to her knees against the wall, and then it kicked in. Have you seen the movie Blade Runner? Yes. And that scene where Harrison Ford, Deckard, Deckard, yes, that scene where Deckard hunts down the replicant, and she lies dying in the rainy street, kicking her life out. That's what it was like that for my mother that day. Really scary. She was thrown to the ground, kicking, trying to tear open her blouse. And I stood over her, trying to keep people away from her. You can't touch her because she is... For the first moment, she, for the first time, she faltered over a word. After a moment's hopeless groping, and she gave up and held up her hand beseechingly. Live, I said. Yes, live. That's the word. Electric. She was very embarrassed, but she recovered, and that was the main thing. She felt silent for a moment, and when she spoke again, her voice had a different, giddier timbre to it. But there is one way of tripping it that I would like to experience. If you make love very hard, it trips the mechanism, and all that electricity, well, the man is supposed to find it very pleasurable. She was looking me straight in the eye now, and to my shame I found out that I was less a man of the world than I had thought. But, she said with a sharp giggle, my boyfriend tries very hard. I lowered my head till a complex wave of embarrassment and disappointment flowed through me. When I looked up, she was on her feet wrapping her scarf about her. I heard myself offering to pay for her coffee and I heard her thanking me. She wished me luck and shouldering a bag, she moved off between the tables to the door. Fifteen minutes later, I stepped out into the leaden day, my head still swimming with what I'd just heard. I walked back through Lilova, turned right under the astronomical clock. Halfway across the old square, I pulled up and looked around me, suddenly feeling very foolish. Of course, how could I have missed it? This city of dolls and mechanicals, the city of robots and golems. What else would you meet but an electric woman? As I stood there laughing, I became aware of the cold and pulled my coat up around my ears. It was the middle of the afternoon, grey skies snagged in the, th in the steeples of the cathedral. Crowds drifted through the square. Three months from now, the city would throng with German and Japanese tourists, making its narrow streets impassable. Coming here in winter had been one of my better ideas. And now turning a full 360, watching all these women move smoothly over the cobble paving in high heels and short skirts, fading into the grey light, I thought then what I now know, that if I lived to be a thousand, I would never visit another city with such a company of tall, beautiful women. Six weeks later, back home, I stood at the bottom of a garden, feeding page by page a sizable manuscript into a small fire. All curdled inspiration and nonsense, every page of it hopeless whimsy, the work of ten weeks. As I stood there peeling off the pages and dropping them into the flames, I thought back to the woman in the pub. And the thing that came back to me clearest of all wasn't what she told me or the strangeness of what she told me. No. What came back to me clearest of all was the fact that one day, in a strange city, a beautiful woman stepped in out of the cold, in out of the blue, sat down beside me and told me a story. And when she'd finished, she picked up her coat and left, as simple and as graceful as that. And that's what came back to me clearest of all.